Welcome back to Vampire Campfire. Is this our first daytime clubhouse session? It is pretty warm outside. It is, yeah. It's nice to sit in front of a fire in late August in Los Angeles. <laughs> in a full suit, no in less. In a full suit. And that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's all about. That's how committed we are to the concept. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a minute. It's been a long, hot summer. Very humid summer. Very humid oh, summer. Yeah, for the oh, yeah. yeah. We've been, we were grinding through the Midwest. Amazing shows. Great people. Very hot weather. Um, and now we're here looking down the barrel of leg three of the Aguao tour. Back to the Midwest. And then, of course, our beloved East Coast. Oh, can't wait. Oh, yeah. Woo! Back to school. Yeah. Tubs run, tubs run the East Coast. They have a lot That's of right. Oh yeah. I mean, ultimately, I, at this point, I think we can say we've we've crisscrossed the country so many times. The, the whole country is is vampire country. There's not a single place I don't think we feel like we have real fans and don't feel at home at. But of course, the East Coast is like true, true vampire country. It's where we're from. It's where we started. But before we get into anything. You guys know what's been on my mind. You've been you've uh, been talking about this for a while. I've, I've been, been, kicking been keeping you up a little bit. It's been keeping me up. I've had a series of uh, prophetic <laughs> dreams. <laughs> um, you know, forced talking to me, and you know, I've mentioned it to you guys. I've called meetings, and here's the thing: I want to tell the vampire community. At first, we were planning that the uh, two shows at the Garden, October fifth and sixth, would be no repeats except a punk. And, of course, we could do it. At this point, our songbook of songs we more or less have under our figures is roughly 50 songs. It's only going to grow over the next few weeks. We could easily put on two full shows. But then I just kept thinking, you know what? I love this tour so much, and I love this show so much. The Agwao show, which is different from Night to Night, but there's certain parameters that kind of anchor it. And I just kept thinking, I don't want to do that for New York. We could do it, and yet... It's our hometown. I've met so many people who've told me, oh, I'm, 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 I'm coming to Sunday show. I hope I, I get this one or that one. And I realized something. We don't want to do two. Here's the thing. When we do two shows in a row, we don't do that many repeats to begin with. There's like, always a lot of variation. Lot of, a lot of variation. Like, a lot I of thought goes into set lists. Yeah. When we did two shows at the Greek Theater in uh, Berkeley, we might have done 10 to 15 songs different between I think like the two. like 15. Maybe I 15. Think a sol- more than 50% different. Yeah, more than I 50% think. different. When we just played two shows in Minneapolis, they're extremely different. But there's certain anchors, and especially with the Agua material. This, this is the main thing that got to me in my series of prophetic dreams that I, I just kept thinking, I love this album, love this tour, love uh, us playing these songs. And I just realized, like, I want to play classical at both shows. It's crazy Mm -hmm. not to. I'm not saying we're going to play the album front to back or anything like that, but a few Aguao songs, a handful of other songs, I think it's going to come in at 70 to 75% different between the two shows. These will be the most two most different shows of any two-day run we're we're doing. We checked with our legal team, and both the original ad and this... Uh, proclamation now are not legally binding. Yeah, so it's true. We should say that the original thing we, the original gauntlet we threw down was no repeats except a punk, and now we're changing it to no, no repeats except a punk. <laughs> no, no repeats. No, no repeats except a punk. No, no repeats except a punk. I think I understand. And they're going to be incredibly different shows, and ones during the day. But and here's and another thing that. I don't know if this is too inside baseball or maybe this is exactly why people um, tune into Vampire Campfire. When we had an amazing uh, Saturday night, Sunday day show at the Greek Theater in Berkeley, just incredible shows. I think the Saturday night show, and we'll get into this as we walk through the whole tour, there was some rough consent. We don't always agree on the shows we think are the best, but there was a pretty good consent. We all felt something after that night, especially. Oh, yeah. Incredible show. And then Sunday was such an amazing vibe, too. Like, it it wasn't that high energy uh, Saturday night thing, but it was this beautiful Father's Day daytime thing. And we did Peggio with Amber Kaufman. It was just such a nice vibe. Two very different shows. And we were talking to the promoter, and we said, you guys have some information based on the, the 
ticket data that you collect about how many people were at both shows because we gave them two very different shows. And, you know, th- this, it's not an exact science because people buy on the secondary market, et cetera. The answer we got, this is a 9,000 capacity venue, right? Yeah. So that means 18,000 bodies were in that. Out of the two shows, we said, how many people were repeat customers? And my man said 200. Now, shout out to those 200. And I know we gave you a great, uh, you know, two show run, but it just made me think a lot about like, A, it's incredible. That means that many different people came to see us in Mm -hmm. the Bay, which is sick. So shout out to all you as well. But it also just made me think like, right, I wanted, we got to do connect both shows, some of the new material and a handful of the old songs. This has been on my mind, uh, I think, for roughly twelve to 15,000 people. They won't even know what we're talking about here. No, no. They'll show up to the one show they bought tickets to and be like, oh, yeah, that was awesome. But <laughs> I know we have some hardcore fans because we've been seeing you. We've had some people yep. ride in the rail mm-hmm. at an insane number of shows where we, we see people all the way from Texas to Montana to Chicago. So we know we have the hardcore fans coming out. And to you, I say... Anybody who has tickets to both garden shows, and you can prove it, you know, you'll email us the stubs or something, we got something special for you. It's going to be some type of very unique merch item that you get for free because we appreciate that you're coming out for Vampire Weekend at Madison Square Garden. And if you, if it, you know, bothers you that you say, I can't believe I heard five to seven great songs twice, and that really sticks in your craw. That really fucked up their weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> if yeah. that ruined your weekend, we understand. Hopefully it was worth it for the other people, but you do deserve something special. And we're going to design a shirt, maybe a long sleeve shirt, could be a tote bag, some sort of merch item that reflects you and your unique status as somebody who came to both shows, Saturday night and Sunday matinee at the garden. Here's my pitch for the design. Yeah, we need some ideas. Yeah. Um, as you can tell by what I'm wearing, I'm very childhood sports uh, gear influenced and also in the jam band community flipping where you take something that looks familiar from, an, from one mm. world and you put it in another context. My first thought would be like a Subway series. Uh-huh. Remember those t-shirts with like Yankees Giambi versus Mets, right. or, what, or whatever yeah, yeah. the two players were, yeah. Yankees, Mets, World Series, you know, so like Saturday night, Sunday morning, or right. the, two, the two games, it sort of has a... Like yeah, you know the dates. The dates are already kind of baked into the design. Mm-hmm. Right, New York centric, like the seven train versus the okay. four or three, whatever yeah. it is at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, um, that'd be my first thought. Sort of a Saturday I like night. That. I would say, wait, yeah, it could be. It could be I think like Mets uh, would be Saturday night. Yankees would be Sunday morning. If yeah, was, it it could be like um, Croker Man, the Frog, wearing blue and orange Saturday right, night, right, and mm. then the. Il Bayo, Il Bayo, right. uh, in pinstripes next day, just head to head, like with baseball bats. I like it. And then there'll definitely maybe something on the back that's kind of like says no repeats except a punk. Crossed, and then that out. crossed, crossed out. Crossed Absolutely out. Absolutely crossed out. And then say f- seven to eight great songs repeated, one of which was a punk. You know, we can be yeah. very literal. Yeah. And it could say, deadpan. Dear Blank. Sorry, you, you fill in your name. Sorry. We're, not gonna do We're that. sorry that you heard five to seven great songs twice. <laughs> We, we love and support you. Maybe we'll even sign it. But look, you're going to get something special. If you're that part of the fan community that was really looking forward to zero repeats. And here's the thing. We can do zero repeats. The thing that got me about it, I think, was like, again, it's mostly out of love of the current tour. Where I just, I just know that we have this great shape and, we, and things come in and out night to night. But there's just certain things that make it feel like the Agwao show to me. And I also was talking to a, a guy who remained nameless, and I was telling him, but yeah, we're going to do no repeats. And he said, don't you have a new album, though? And I said, Damn. Yeah, you, you know what, man? Yeah. You're right. We, then you was explaining, well, we're doing this thing. And yeah. We're doing yeah. this yeah. thing. And I was like, you know what, though? We do have a new album. A new album rules. So anyway, that, that, that's the thing that's been on my mind uh, with The Garden. Uh, I hope you understand. Yeah. And, um, and also, for because pe- we've, we've been getting people, I mean, I was saying in my just day-to-day thing, I'm sure you guys too, you saw we had some emails where people saying, oh, which show should I come to? And basically what I want to say is you don't know what you're going to get. I, if, the thing I would say is there's going to be such significant difference between Saturday night and Sunday mm-hmm. day. I would mostly just think about which vibe suits you more. Are you looking for a Saturday night experience? Because no matter what we do, the shows yeah. we, we have found doing this a few times yeah. now that no matter how we approach it, what the set lists are, we could put all party songs on Sunday morning and it'll still have a different feel oh, yeah. than Saturday Night Show will. So yeah. I think that, that there is a baked in of the start time and day 
that does kind of influence how the show feels. The afternoon versus the night in particular. Yeah. There's a, an old saying that this makes me think of, which is that no repeats lasts a weekend, but a t-shirt or a tote bag or whatever lasts forever. Exactly. Legendary, right. a legendary that's a, saying. That's a saying. That's right. We, we could fit that onto the shirt or tote bag somewhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm sensing a lot of text on the back of the shirt. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's just a lot it's a of book? text. There's the the bit about the no a punk crossed out and the new thing. There's like a apology letter. Yeah. There's maybe the set list of the both shows to still prove. Oh, okay. You know, there's yeah. a lot of text yeah. I can see. And maybe at the very bottom, an almost unreadable dense text. Yeah. I'll yeah, write. Really- I'll write. Um, a detailed description of each of my series of prophetic dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I also think we could say maybe before we leave MSG that outside of all of this, there's some unique, possibly one time only things happening at these shows that we're already planning. Oh yeah. To talk about. Oh my God. That are sort of outside of this conversation. Yeah. We're going to make them, we're going to make them very special and it's, it's special at the garden no matter what, but yeah, we, we got to, this is I, the more I think about it, this feels like the correct middle ground for all of the people attending. We're going to do right by the the hardcore free T-shirt people, and we're going to do right by the blissfully unaware of the <laughs> the various schemes we come up with type people who just say, "I want to see Vampire Weekend in New York." Oh, I'm bu- I'm I'm busy Saturday night. I'm going on Sunday. They're they're not thinking about it. But anyway, we know a lot of people are, and we we love the fact that you are. So we're just keeping it real about what feels right in this moment. And maybe we should plan a no repeats thing just for any hater who says, oh, they chickened out because they couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Of course we can do it. Even Easy. if you just look through the last few weeks, we, you could see we have enough songs in the mix that you could spread them out into two shows. So we'll come do it. But I think maybe just do that at like a different venue or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure that part out. But anyway, maybe it's worth walking through uh, the first leg of the tour to well, we we're, we're, when we last left off yeah. this this great saga, we only got to release week. It was early right. April. We're, it was early. <laughs> so early got, April. We made we it to Coachella. Did we make it to I Coachella? Think Coachella, Coachella, Coachella was the end. Yeah, that feels like a million years ago. It really does. Yep. It's also funny too because you know when I talk about the the Agwao show or what to me is important about the Agwao show, it's not that we have a set set list, but again, there's these certain tentpole things that happen, and. That did not start until uh, we were in Houston, After, Texas. Yeah, yeah. June. So yeah. occasionally I run into somebody and they say, oh man, yeah, how's the tour going? I saw you at Coachella and I'm just like, oh yeah, that was some... You didn't see shit. <laughs> you didn't see anything. You didn't see shit. Hey buddy, you didn't see shit. <laughs> hey, can I talk to you for a second privately? <laughs> you didn't see shit. <laughs> um, right, so we made it back from Coachella. Um, the real tour started in Houston. Should we, should we talk about SNL? I think, wasn't that oh, before yeah. the tour? Was SNL? Be- Absolutely. Yeah. I believe it was. It was the first time playing SNL with a previous Vampire Campfire guest, Mr. R.L. Rekshide. That's right. It's true. Um, yeah, it was great to have him. Someone pointed out to me that it was, it was 11 years to the day of our previous SNL. That's crazy. Our, yeah. our last uh, SNL yeah. appearance. Yeah, that's intense. Eleven years really flies by. <laughs> we really we cooked up a nice light uh, sports narrative over the course of our performance. From the promos to oh, the yeah. performances. Well, because we start, you know, we, there's a pr- promo, but then first song, a bunch of people not wearing sports hats except, oh, except one man, Ariel, Ariel wearing yeah. a Dodgers hat, and which we, we felt could not go unchallenged. Yeah, we get it. He's, he's from yeah. LA. He's going to rep the Dodgers, but. I always think it's a little bit weird to, when you're from a, a great uh, storied sports region like the tri-state area, mm-hmm. and then you move to a place like LA, and then you become a Dodgers fan. That's crazy. But you know, of course, he, that's different. That's for Ariel. He's from LA. He could be a Dodgers fan, but as an organization, we can't. Yeah, just leave that sitting no, there. I wasn't, yeah, so, no, I wasn't going to let that so happen. So then what happened in the second song? Second song, I put on a Mets hat. And so there was a Dodger hat and a Met hat being represented to sort of balance things out. Balance. And then in goodbyes, I think I put on a Nets t-shirt. Well, then, that was, more. Then, then we went, oh, yeah. then for the, full. for the goodbyes, we went full New York. We said, no. You know what's funny? I barely remember this, and it was only a couple months ago. Feels like a lifetime yeah. ago. Yeah, you were re- repping the New Jersey Nets. Yes. Now Brooklyn Nets, of those of you have um, paying attention. 
And then I had a rare uh, 90s Knicks sweatshirt that my friend Anya lent me, um, which famously was worn by uh, the character Rachel Green on Friends. Oh, nice. Google. That Ra- very one or that design? That design. Okay. I mean, could have been that one. And of course, the Knicks were in the playoffs at the time, as were the Rangers. The Rangers, and I was wearing a Rangers jacket. So there was New York sports fever, which ended fairly soon after that. <laughs> Those were the good times. Those were the good times. Yeah. Um, should also say we had kind of a crazy week that week because we did SNL rehearsal and promo Thursday. Then instead of chilling in New York City on a Friday, we decided mm. to fly to Salt Lake City and play at Kilby Block Party. And then we flew back. Which was an awesome festival. To New York. Great it was, festival. And I just wanted to say it was the first time I ever had a dream come true from Vampire Campfire. Oh, Which right. was that, you know, I... I Put myself out there in our, I believe, second episode requesting uh, to meet or hang out with a real housewife of Salt Lake City. And the great Heather Gay agreed to come to our show and play a little bit of Gold Rush during the campus intro. And Mm -hmm. just want to say thank you, Heather, for joining the stage with us. You're awesome. And uh, it was a real highlight of my year to get to do that. She seems like a very cool person, very enthusiastic. Yes. And I wonder, because, you know... I'm, I'm not doing as much about the housewives as you, but one thing I know is that they're major. Big deal. Oh, yeah. So I wouldn't have shocked me, nor would I have been offended if as soon as she tossed that last bag, she had to jet off somewhere. Oh, yeah. But she was cool. She stayed. She was awesome. She wanted to talk to us. She was sending videos for to you and your wife. And Unbelievable. There. She's a massive fan. Yeah, she was hanging. In fact, we're the ones who had to run. I know. To get back to New York. We had to get back to New we York. We had to fly back to New York. And she, she actually gave us one very light spoiler of the upcoming season of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And she said that uh, retroactively... She feels like that scene is in tribute to Vampire Campfire. So right. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. But I was very, very touched by the entire experience. That was a great weekend. Amazing weekend. Yeah. But it was hard. I mean, you know, not 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 complaining, but like it's definitely not ideal from a, a sleep and a physical wellness point of view mm-hmm. to um, do that uh, New York Salt Lake shuffle in, in, 20, <laughs> in 24 hours and then perform on live TV. But actually, so glad it worked out because it's one of those things that when you first hear about it, you're like, oh, cool, SNL, yeah, that's fun. And it's like, well, don't forget, you got to go play a Kilby. Like, oh, man, because you don't want it to, like, be actually make both things worse. Of course. Like, not give, not give our all at Kilby and, and then show up at SNL all messed up. But, uh, yeah, it was a great weekend. It all worked out. I have to say, I was surprised... It, the layoff was long between our last appearance and we'd done mm. it a couple times in, uh, you know, in the early days. And, I, you know, I kind of I walked in like feeling like, oh, you know, like I got this. I know the situation. I know the pace of the weekend, even with the Kilby Court add-in. And I got really nervous during Gen X. Like really? over the course of the song. I don't know why. It's like maybe because we hadn't played it a ton in the way that mm. some of the older ones, we'd like there had been more shows beforehand or something. Um, but I was, surpri- I was surprised at how nervous. I don't think I really... I thought you played great. Too bad. I thought Thank you played you. great. Yeah, I love those late fills at the end of that song, and I thought you were just locked in. Well, that's good to hear. But I, I, I was surprised that I, like the rising tide of nervousness. I don't know. Yeah, I just, I just couldn't turn it off. Live TV. It's, yeah, there is nothing like it. Yeah, and then the real. Oh, and then we had to do production production rehearsals, rehearsals. And, then, and then it's time for the real tour. Well, we went to Europe first. Oh my god! <laughs> you think you're on the real tour? I'm getting tired just thinking also, about we did, it. We did Jazz Fest too. We did. I, well, I didn't do Jazz right. Fest. Yeah. I, I missed my first show in 17 years. But you guys did great from everything I heard. Yeah, last minute, last minute sickness, but we uh, we we pulled together. Everything happens at the right time, as discussed. If there's one place for someone to miss a show, it's Jazz Fest. Of course, it's the Which big is, easy. They're just relaxed, just looking a, for some it's good the big music. easy. B, jazz is famously about improvisation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and just the vibe of Jazz Fest is like, it's, it's also, I, I know somebody we work with said this back in the day. They said, Jazz Fest, that's the People's Festival. Mm. So it's kind of like, A, of course, we're, without you, how could we possibly be firing on all cylinders, just bringing it? But it is a, 
it's not it's not a slick festival. It's it's just like very like kind of warm crowd. We're playing during the day too. Mm-hmm. There's not like a big video wall or anything. So just the energy is totally different. We made it through that. Then we go to Europe for uh, what Radio was it? One Big Weekend. Radio One Big and Weekend Dreamer. in Luton. Yeah, in Luton. I can still remember the song. I get, in some ways, this might be one of the the most graily things I've ever seen. I think you saw it too, C2. Did you stay to the end of Coldplay? It's all good. I had to... I had to, I had to um, no, watch just, her, no, there's a hockey cool, game. Cool. The Rangers okay. were playing. It's okay, man. It's okay. I, would, I would have loved to have seen Coldplay. I had to get back to London to and watch hockey. Cold, and you've seen, seen Coldplay, Coldplay before. You've yeah. seen the show. Coldplay Nation, do not come for this <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> Please go play Nation. <laughs> as, as discussed, the Rangers were in the playoffs. <laughs> to pick up Coldplay, what? I thought Chris Martin was shockingly tall. Oh, yeah. You never know when you meet people, I thought he was shockingly tall. Yep. He's I didn't a, actually meet him, he just like walked somewhat close to me. And I he's was a impressed. menace on the court, too. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. Um, but, you know, Coldplay, they, they did a, a, a Coldplay set full of um, uh, all the classic Coldplay songs we know and love. The, you got Yellow, Viva La Vida. I mean, truly, just endless supply of bangers from them. But the grail that I, I felt blessed to witness was a song Chris Martin made up for that show. Mm. After the, I think it was after they cut off the, uh, the live broadcast. Yeah. And the song is called Orange. Uh, and just real quick, there, there was some talk about that some people thought it might be disrespectful for Coldplay to play their famous hit song, Yellow, because the song Yellow is associated with Watford. I believe that's the big who, rival. Who are the enemies, the sworn enemies of the people of Luton who rep the color orange. So there was some talk about, oh man, don't, you better not play Yellow because uh, that's like a disrespectful song. Of course they still played Yellow, nobody cared. But at the end he said, you know, there's all this discussion about should we or should we not play Yellow. Uh, of course we're going to play Yellow, but here's what I'm going to do. I wrote something just for you. And he wrote an original song called Orange, which I'm sure, I'm almost positive, will never be performed again. And I still kind of remember it. I remember the chorus. It goes, I was born in love with Luton, and I'm always going to be. And he just played it with a Casio. I remember it pretty well. I mean, the man's got away with the words and melody, and it's still, oh, yeah. it's still kind of stuck in my head. But that was... Uh, I've, I've missed a lot of special shows in my life. Should have caught that band before they broke up. Should have caught that person before they died. But I can say I saw a true one-off in a very unique setting in Luton. We're in touch with Chris Martin's people to play Orange at MSG. That's one of the, I didn't want to ruin the surprise. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the whole backstory to be a whole thing. We'll tell a 10-minute tale. For the then, Knicks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Orange yeah. <laughs> represents the Knicks. Wait, what basketball team has yellow? Uh, Lakers? Well, the Lakers, famously. Okay. Now, you know Vampire Weekend can't come into the garden, <laughs> the temple of New York basketball, and cover the Coldplay song, Yellow. Boo, I know, I know, I know. Great song, but we can't play it. We fucking hate the Lakers out here. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like a 15-minute PowerPoint presentation. Are you aware of the, the of the small town Luton outside of <laughs> London? Just like three people. So, of course, you know about their football team. Yeah, so we played the Radio 1 Big Weekend, and then we played Primavera. Primavera, which is so much fun. And speaking of long tours, I don't know if this is important to anyone else, but I was thinking about this recently, is that our compatriot, Brian Robert Jones, who toured with us for Father the Bride, yeah. and is now touring with Paramore, we, we had one day off in Barcelona before we played Primavera, just of the schedule. Mm. And Paramore was opening for... Uh, Taylor Swift's The Eras Tour, the Europe leg. Right. And it was like, we could almost, we were trying to just kind of realize it. He texted us and some of us were trying to figure out a train or a plane. It was all kind of pricey and it would be like 100 degrees and shit. So we like didn't, didn't end up making it. But speaking of long ass tours. Right. That was lifetimes ago yeah. in May. And I, I feel well, like he finished. just got home. Yeah, they just finished. Like this week. So the, that's, a, that's a long tour. Meaning Param- God bless. Paramore's part of the Eras Tour just ended. Well, the, the, the whole the, thing. The whole, they they did all of the whole European tour. It's like Aeros twelve tour. weeks. Yeah. So, like the entire the entire life that you've lived yeah. since Primavera, right? The Aeros tour was happening in Europe. That's which is amazing. Tour. I mean, yeah. And I feel like when I was vaguely hearing about it, 
I feel like they were doing a show at Wembley in London like every other week. I think there was two Wembley back. runs. Yeah, they maybe, went back. But yeah, but then they're like back. It was confusing to me. I mean, when there's that much demand, I mean, you got to you you figure keep, it out, I guess. It's like Billy Joel at the Garden. Yeah, absolutely. And with much respect to the Eras Tour in Europe, uh, I was very impressed by, by the length of that. Yeah, that's hardcore. That's real road dog. Yeah, yeah. Respect. All right, and then we kicked off the we kicked off the the Dubs then Agua we, World right. Tour. Then Agua. Then the tour started. Truly begins. Starting in the great state of Texas, a couple great shows in Houston and Dallas. You were trying out your famous bit of saying what night it was. But you oh guys, yeah, you guys were bringing some crazy Wednesday energy. Wait, was that in Houston? I believe it was in the, or the first the second show. show? I oh, thought it was the first first one. one. Yeah, the first show. Wait, what did I say? I was and I meant it. I was saying. This is cra- this is fucking crazy for a Wednesday when it was oh, yeah. Thursday. I kept saying I can't believe the energy y'all are bringing on a Wednesday. I'm absolutely blown away, and I think I might have even said something. I mean, right now this feels more like Thursday night energy. <laughs> I said it very confidently too, and then CT let me know uh, later, about halfway through the show, that it was in fact Thursday. So I had to tell them. This is about hat, right. Hat in hand. Yeah. Came back hat in hand. This is about right. I may have gotten the. The night wrong, but uh, at least I accurately gauged the energy. <laughs> Y'all were bringing Thursday night energy on a Thursday night, so let's see if we can uh, make some noise and get it to Friday. Come on, guys. Um, yeah, it's and then I feel like later in the tour, not on stage, but I, I, I guess this is classic. I don't know if this happens to you guys, just having no idea what day it was. I actually was to, when we were uh, had a day off in um, Iowa. And I was just walking around. I was uh, catching up with Ariel on the phone. And we were just talking, blah, blah, blah. He's driving around L.A. And I said, where are you going anyway? And he said, I'm going to get my teeth cleaned. And I, again, very confidently was like. On a Saturday? On on the weekend? I I literally said, (laughs) I really said on a Saturday? Man, you a VIP. And he was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) It's a weekday. And I was like, okay. That was Um, confusingly a Friday. The day off was confusingly. I, I know what you're saying. I didn't know it was a Friday, but well, there, I knew it was a Friday. There is a, there's a famous phrase in our industry that's a crew Friday. Or what do they say? R- Roadie Friday? Or? Which is, you know, a, a crew Friday. We, yeah, word, as but. we've talked about when Josh was on the show, uh, not all uh, live music professionals like the term roadie. Right. It could be seen as condescending. But you hear it as crew, crew Friday is what people say. Crew Friday. That's when you have the next day off. off. No matter can, what, yeah, yeah. Right, so a crew Friday could be a any Monday. Day of the it week. could be a Sunday. Any day of the week. Um, so I guess when you're on the road, any day off is a Saturday. Yeah, What? Do, so in those early shows, you know, we're starting to bring the real Agua out production. Mm-hmm. We're starting to, like, really give the, the show some shape. Um, I'm trying to think, in that first run of shows between Texas, Arizona, Arizona San Diego, San Diego do we already starting to kind of like mix up the set list from night to night? Oh, yeah. uh, I think Dallas was our first like tour version of uh, Gold Rush, Cocaine Cowboys, um, because we have brought people on to play the game Gold Rush. Um, celebrities like Heather Gay, Paris Hilton, Abraham Lincoln, things of that nature. But we always knew that once we got to the real tour, you know, we wanted to launch that aspect of the show with some explosive big names, but we knew once we hit the road for the people, we're bringing it to the people. Yeah. And, um, I believe we discussed on the show, some of our ideas for the game and, uh, we stayed true to it. We've been handing out big cash prizes at shows where we play cocaine cowboys, which is not every show. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to see. We had a couple people wearing cocaine cowboys merch, uh, from the first show, but you know, you're not going to get cocaine cowboys every night. Um, Has uh, our accountant called you up and screamed at you yet? He's been a little bit pissed. He said um, he's got me on a watch list (laughs) because I've been feeling too generous, especially when I feel the vibe of the crowd. And so so we bring somebody on stage. If you haven't seen it before, this is part of the Cocaine Cowboys medley. We bring out our proprietary game called Gold Rush, which in some ways has some minor similarities with uh, Cornhole. So in, in that they're both a bag toss type game. And we bring somebody from the crowd, and they get three chances to get in the hole. Interestingly, so far, there have been so few holes. We got so few two? Makes. So few makes. Have, so few been, makes. Yeah, so few there makes. There was one pure make, and then one that was, like, edging, that you you give a big hop. Yeah. That, that like, 
yeah. that it fell in. Like, yeah. So more often than not, somebody gets on stage, and and you know we talked about it. It's a lot of pressure on them, but they tend to make zero, and um, still been handing out usually minimum three hundred dollars just for their troubles coming on stage. And the crowd is always going nuts. And I asked the crowd, "Do you think this person who, who sank zero gold rushes?" Deserves three hundred dollars, and the, we have very generous crowds. They always make some noise. You know, there was oh, except for one crowd. Oh, one right. guy yeah, lost happened? the crowd. I don't remember he what was the from town a it, suburb of he, Chicago. He was in the, one of our Chicago shows, and you know, normally before they come up, they ask like, "What's your name? Yeah. Where are you from?" You're gonna have to say that on stage, whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, "I'm from Chicago." Uh, and then, but on stage, he said, "I'm from I think something called like Brookfield, Brook something that like that." I'm, right. I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, and then there was like a slight pause and people were taking it back and you're like Chicago right and the crowd was, was like, like no boom, boom, boom. yeah I guess it's one of those places yeah people don't want the people from the suburbs to claim the city which um, is complicated you know of course it's a complicated issue yeah well, uh, but that was the one time I think that the the contestant lost the crowd yeah. and he won them back over over the over the course of the game yeah. but that, that was the the only moment of um of tension they didn't want say. him taking home 300 bucks and yes, and then we've had people who actually sank some, so that then they've made even more money. So uh, yeah, the accountant is not happy. He wants it to be cut and dry. You get the you get the bag in the hole. You get a hundred bucks. But but you ain't stopping anytime soon. Not stopping anytime <laughs> soon. And I hope people come prepared because um, you never know. You might be asked to participate. Um, well, that's one of the reasons you went to. You went to Paris for the Olympics and to go to a tax shelter for a couple of days. That's right. You were scared to come back to LA because <laughs> LA alone, was Switzerland. Wait, was Actually, for you. you know what's funny about the Olympics that I've been thinking of, and a lot of people have, uh, is you know there's there's been all this drama about break dancing yep, at yep. the Olympics. Uh, people just savagely criticizing not only Ray Gun, the dancer from Australia, but I've even hear, heard some haters say that a lot of the break dancers were technically proficient, but they lacked the soul of um, 1980s New York City or whatever. You can never recreate a contest. Yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't, whatever. Like a Saturday or Sunday morning. It's, it's going to be different. Then I read that they're not going to have break yeah. dancing in the 2028 LA Olympics. And it's not Ray Gunn's fault, although, of course, people are going to blame No, that was before, yeah. before anybody heard of Ray Gunn that was going to Pe- be happening. There's going to be a lot of fake news, people blaming Ray Gunn for decades, saying that the one time breakdancing was in the Olympics, she ruined it. And, uh, you know, we're sorry for you, Ray Gunn, that people be saying that kind of misinformation. We know it's not true. But, yeah, it was before it even happened. Because I guess each host city gets to uh, oh, like a- choose a few... Extra Some things. wild card slots? Yeah. So, you know oh, one of the wild card slots for LA 28? I have no idea. Flag football. Ooh. That's fun. I know it's hard to believe, but flag. But by the time you're getting to flag football, is some form of bag toss really that oh, I different? See. I see where this is going. No. And... And, you know, there's a lot of red tape with cornhole. There's, like, societies. There's governing bodies. But there's red. none of that with, with gold, gold, gold rush. rush. Yeah. There's no red tape. And also... Cornhole is so regional and culturally specific to America. There's a lot of places where they don't eat corn. Um, whereas, I'll tell you one thing that everybody who watches the Olympics knows about. Gold. It makes so much sense. I get so it. I, get it. I, didn't, I didn't get it at first. <laughs> yeah. So, we're pitching for LA 28. I, I'm not saying drop flag football, but if you have to, you have to. But Ed Goldrush a proprietary bag toss game that we will license to the Olympics. And we'll play the opening ceremony of the gold rush tournament. Yeah. We, were, we don't have to play. The, I mean, we would certainly, yeah, but yeah. Uh, that's okay. Right. But at the back at the gold rush uh, venue. Yep. Which could even be back here for God's sake. Yeah, absolutely. We can host it at the clubhouse. We'll waive an origination fee. We'll, we'll waive the, the fee to, to host. Wait, this is, this is, maybe we have to have our own, Alternative Olympics, if they don't go for it. The Vampire right Olympics. Here. Yeah. We could have a Battle of the Bands for Vampire Weekend cover bands. Um, Gold Rush tournament. And then just all the usual stuff. Shot put. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Swimming. High jump. Butterfly. High jump would be butterfly great. Butterfly stroke. High jump. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, so start training. If you're a Vampire Weekend fan, start training for uh, LA 28. Yeah, I remember I really enjoyed the Phoenix show. I guess it's been a minute. It's, it's a little bit hard to remember exactly what we're doing. Well, let's talk about Ska Night. Yeah, I mean, the, the, first, the, the obvious one that was on some different shit was Ska Night at the Hollywood Bowl, which I think went better than we even could have imagined it. It was amazing. You know, like sometimes you, you never know with this kind of a one-off idea. Is that going to be something where you feel like, all right, good thing was a one-off or... Um, you wish you could take that on the road. Yeah. But Ska Night was perfect. Uh, I, 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 the energy from Voodoo Glow Skulls getting the crowd hyped. They were sick. To, they were, so, they were good, so cool. To English beat, just again, even amping up the energy that much more and dropping these beloved hits like uh, Tenderness, Mirror in the Bathroom, um, Save It for Later. By the time we hit the stage, truly, I'd never felt that kind of energy at the bowl before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just crazy. Our fourth show at the Bowl, um, and unanimously our best show at the Bowl. I think certainly by far, in my opinion. And we brought some ska flavor ourselves. We that's the first, the debut of Scottiman, which has stayed in the uh, songbook ever since. Yeah, we we've, haven't we've played done, a regular Ottoman a single time on this tour. We've been doing Scottiman. We've which, done four or five Scottimans. We only did. Um, Giving up the ska, what do we call it? Ska gun. Ska gun. Giving up the ska gun at the Hollywood Bowl. And maybe we'll bring it back again, or maybe that's a good one to leave at the bowl. That was kind of like our tribute to the Voodoo Glow Skulls. Yeah. We had Tim Robinson come out on stage and wave at the audience. That was one for the heads. When we played a little bit of Dangerous Nights. Whoa. Dangerous Nights debut. Yeah, just a, just a beautiful night. And I think that was a Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday they were bringing Thursday night energy. Oh, right. I was really feeling that Thursday night energy. No, that, but truly, like, the bowl is a funny place because it's such a great venue, but you don't always feel the energy on stage because you have the boxes in the front. Well, there's such, there's such a built-in, usually at a big outdoor amphitheater, there's some seats, but the way that the, the boxes are, it's just like the sitting is kind of, and it's fine. And also, I, I think, personally, you can come show, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Like, right. you bought a ticket, if you want to yeah. sit down, sit down. That's sure. not, you shouldn't feel bad about that. Uh, but there is something about those boxes that is like it's hard to like get a a real crowd feel and yeah. like the, you know only a couple levels up does is kind of a more GA feeling and and sort of the more the people that might normally be up front are sort of in, in the, the back. back right um, so it's, sometimes it's hard to feel that and reach that but uh, but yeah this time I didn't I felt that in previous ones and even in some shows I've attended there you can you can kind of feel that uh, but but. Yeah, for whatever reason, that one, it felt like we, it felt like from front to back. Right. You, know, you could feel it coming back. Great. If there's any question, is Southern California vampire country? <laughs> Our fourth show at the bowl finally oh, yeah. answered it. Oh, yeah. Wow, you guys are bringing that East Coast energy. I'm getting shades of Boston, Philly, maybe even a little bit of New York. Woo! All right, guys. <laughs> but what you were just saying, CT, about, you know, you don't care. People sit, stand, whatever it shows. Did you guys know that at Eagle shows, it's illegal to stand up? Interesting. Then they have like is that gonna be an true entire crew that goes around making sure nobody stands up what? at shows. Well, I guess there's that's like forced equitableness or something yeah. of like, as not everyone, some people want to stand, but not everyone wants to stand. And I, you know, sometimes you're sitting, someone in front of you stands, like, oh, what do I, what do, I do in this yeah. situation? That does seem very draconian, though. Tough. I wonder if they're, are they, I wonder if they're gonna do that in the sphere. Right. Yeah. I you bet could, they will. You could really see both sides of it. There's the kind of like, you know, helping out the people who just can't stand. Maybe mm -hmm. they even have a disability. Right. Like, let them have a good show. But then, there, remember, there's, on the flip side, there's that viral moment where a really excited fan was standing at Adele's Vegas show, uh -huh. and the usher was saying, "Sit down, man." And he was like, "And he was like, oh my god, what?" And and to be fair, he was the only guy standing up, as I recall in the video. So there probably were. He was probably ruining the moment for. Let's not get crazy here. Like 15 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else could probably see, and but Adele saw what was happening, and she and she said, "No, no, 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 no! You let him stand." And he was like, "Oh my God, thank you so much!" And he was really touched. And um, you just can't please everybody. No. So that guy, Adele, made him feel so good by saving him and saying, "You're allowed to stand up." And meanwhile, there's probably a, a guy sitting behind him. Uh, it's like I paid a lot for these seats. I want to see yeah. Adele yeah. sing. Maybe he's a veteran, and he. 
injured, got hurt serving, protecting this nation. And he's like, yeah, totally. I wish I could stand. Anything's possible. <laughs> I mean, you can't win sometimes. I, uh, in high school, I, I went to a, a Green Day show with two of my best friends, one of who was 4'10 and one of who was 6'5. And on the way home... Still 4'10 or has it grown since then? 4'10. Okay. They got into an extremely intense argument over the ethics of tall people standing at the front of concerts. Between, between your two yes. friends did? Yeah. Did you say Switzerland? I just, sh I shut up. Yeah, I was, it wasn't my, wasn't said mine. as a guy who's roughly six, two and three quarters, I got no dog in this <laughs> fight. I, no, I, I. But you're more of a, well, we, this has been discussed. Like, you're more, wait, you're are more you, of a Are you six, guys. three? Let's, well, we need to bring, uh. We need to have an official measure. measure. We yeah. need to get, we need to do an official. And by the way, the, 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 the two friends that were fighting, I know you don't want to name drop, but it was. Tom Cruise and Jack Reacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went to Green Day in high school. With, with the two Tom of them. Cruise with Tom and Jack Cruise Reacher. And Jack Reacher. There's um, something that's going to be always funny to me now about the height 6'5". Yeah, it's yeah. just like 6'5 is now a hilarious height yeah, to me. It's a concept. It's, a, it's Jack Reacher's height. Yeah. No, but, well, I, I, I try not to stand if it's a seated concert in front of I'm always aware people. of like is in a GA section of trying yeah. to like find a spot that's not directly in front of someone yeah. shorter than is, is, again I, you can't please everyone I went um it's hard I went to see Olivia Rodrigo last week mm. a great show really really loved it went to the Intuit Dome and I was very worried that there would be uh, small children behind me there wasn't but you know shorter people and I did kind of like when everybody was standing up I did a little wall sit up against the mm. Which is a great way to get a workout yeah, without yeah. blocking somebody's mm. view. That was sort of my my way of dealing with that. Obviously, the best venues tend to have a great have, side have tiered yeah. seating with yeah. great sight lines where there's not a bad seat in the house. Yeah, I mean, I'm I do support the the seated show as a concept. I, I it would get weird if you were just kind of like a normal vampire weekend show, you're just like, this one's seated. I like the idea of building a show that's made to be seated. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Eagles are doing that. I mean, it's going to be hard to sit down during life in the fast lane. How, would I, how, how can you do that? Yeah. But again, if like, if it was a special show where you picked venues that are great to sit at and, and you, craft a, seated and you show. craft a seated show, that I love. And that way... You, and also, you give everybody a, a heads up, or even if uh, even if you don't say it at first, later you do a podcast or something to say, "Hey yeah, guys, yeah. after a, a series <laughs> of considerations, that's a great way, yeah. <laughs> prophetic <laughs> dreams, a series of prophetic dreams, yeah, we yeah. decided this is going to be a seated tour. Yeah, just a heads up, and you're going to have a great time. And if you're somebody who's excited about standing, you get a free T-shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah, because like. I, we've all, I'm sure, had great experiences going to see, you know, like a classical music or a ballet or something where I was like, oh, yeah, of, of course I don't want to stand during this. Mm -hmm. I can really take it in in a different way. I can think of a Gillian Welch show that I saw. That and was it was an, seated. All, it was like a theater. Everyone stayed seated and it was amazing. Did anybody like jump up? Not in my sight line. I was in the balcony, so I didn't see the whole floor, but... I remember actually seeing what was a great show uh, a few years ago, Bob Dylan at the Pantages Theater mm. on the Rough and Rowdy Ways Tour, which was so good. And Bob's crowd is older, and that album is, generally speaking, a lot of down-tempo, highly lyrical, long songs. Everybody was sitting down, and then um, he busted out a friend of the devil towards the end, and there was one hippie girl who you, you could tell she probably goes to Ooh. a lot of like jam shows and she couldn't help it anymore she was <laughs> in the house but again it, it, everybody without saying it everybody understood that this bob tour had that kind of vibe we had the legend mike gordon uh best known as the bassist from fish but has his own project uh his own band who who came and played starting in berkeley and go, uh, doing that whole pack and dubs uh run with us culminating in seattle the Climate Pledge Arena. Mm -hmm. We all took the pledge, and he sat in, and we played Chalk Dust. That's right. Into Mirror in the Bathroom, back into Chalk Dust. You know, it's such a crazy coincidence because 
we'd been talking about doing a version of Shock Dust Torture for months. Yeah. We jammed on it before. And then when it became clear that uh, Mike would be doing this run with us, then I was like, oh, of course, that's when we're going to do it. But then, and I had some vague, vague memory of just scrolling of somewhere that Fish had covered uh, Mirror in the Bathroom before. But I only thought of it, of course, because we had just done a show with English Beat. And then when you look and say, well, when did they do Mirror in the Bathroom? It was one minute, whatever that was in the 90s. I want to say 11 98 Worcester. Worcester. 11 98 and, and it was out of chalk dust, and that just seemed like so perfectly aligned. Synchronous. Yeah. How could we possibly have known? Or did we know mm. when, when we booked this tour? Um, I actually have questions for both of you. CT, how did it feel to step out from behind the drum mm. set, walk to the front of the stage, and sing a song as the lead vocalist for the first time in our band's history? And then Ezra, how did it feel to step behind the drum set mm. and play drums on stage <laughs> at a Vampire Weekend show for the first time? Well, luckily, I've... I feel like the singing, you just kind of let, let it go at a certain point, and it was a great singing. It, it worked in the room. Who, who's to say? Who's it to went say off. there's a recording? It went off. A recording you can listen to and listen mm. to the notes. What's a note, anyways? Uh, but I feel like, honestly, I, I remember more last time I played MSG, uh, where there was a, a guitar moment on the Father Bride tour, where I would come up and play some, some steel pedally licks on the normal guitar. Told you now. Yeah. Right. Um, and that... I remember sort of taking that in and being like, ooh, I'm not used to this view. So maybe having that experience and done that a few few times over the tour, that the walking up was maybe a little bit less of a total total jump, where if I'd never yeah. <laughs> done that before, mm. it probably would have been a little bit more of a, of a leap. Very big Fish fan, have been for a long time, and to be playing that song, playing the guitar, singing it, looking over at Mike, doing like the ending lick and... We nailed that. Yeah, I mean, just like a very surreal, like amazing, amazing moment. But if I was like thinking that while I'm playing, it probably would have, I would have fucked it up more than, than it would have been anyways. In uh, an arena, no less. True. Mm -hmm. In the Climate Pledge arena. Dubs <laughs> isn't arenas Washington. very often. No, it's nope. true. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that the, there was enough to not think about that I tried really hard to not think about it. I probably would have been more nervous if, it was, if I was going up and singing like a, a random cover without the person in the bit, you know, that mm. might have been in some ways more nerve wracking because it was just Banner like too overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like too overwhelming that it was like, it was mm. easy to, to let it, let it go. And it went off. The energy was great. I mean, for me, of course, Garrett is holding it down. It, I, I knew, I knew that he had my back, but that said, I gave my all to the performance and I like being back there. I mean, well, I guess also for me, I could, I could say similar to CT, I had some familiarity with leaving my spot. Because right. Could, just because on this album, been experimenting more with wireless mm, guitar, and wireless and, mic, yeah. which for me above all, I, w I wouldn't even say it's a sense of freedom or anything. I actually just, it's just a sense of novelty that I still have even having done it for a few months where it kind of just breaks up the show more for me, where it's like, oh, check it out, I'm in this area now. So, yeah, I just like being in different parts of the stage because it, uh, I don't know, just like changes my perspective a little bit. It's fun back there. Yeah, it is fun back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some ways you have a better view, being up a little higher, the way that we have it set up. Yeah, that was just a great moment. Um, the energy was great. And the truth is, you know, when I say we, we don't play arenas that that much, I think we've we've always tried to be really thoughtful about venue choice. Um, so far, so good. Maybe a couple of times we picked the wrong spot. We've been doing this a long time, 16 years, can't win them all. But I think we have a high batting average. And, you know, we've definitely always believed that, like, our music and our vibe works well outdoors. We've had such good luck with so many outdoor shows this year that uh, we're not uh, halted or canceled due to weather. That's the risk you always run. But we've yep. had so many good ones. And even uh, most recently in Milwaukee when it's raining, okay, we got to wait an hour to go on stage, but then we could play a normal show and it's great. So arenas can always be tricky. Uh, it's never felt like something we've wanted to step into too quickly. And, you know, and so whenever there's been a choice between usually like a, a kind vibe amphitheater or an arena, even if they're similar capacity, we've always gone with the amphitheater. For me... Maybe you guys too. I was, felt like, oh, wow, Seattle, like going for an arena. Is that going to be our vibe? 
is the atmosphere going to be right? Are the fans going to feel like this is a good place to see us? And that was, and, and the Climate Pledge Arena is a pretty special place. It's oh, yeah. brand new. Yeah. It's right in the center of town. It's probably about as good as it gets for an arena. But anyway, the, when I think of that show and I think of that moment and how good it felt, I, I just think like, all right, that, that really worked. That was not like a nece- sometimes playing an arena feels like a necessary evil. Like, well, where else are you gonna play? That was actually a great vibe. Yeah, it felt good. Loved it. And that just leaves Missoula. Uh, yeah, another doubleheader. Two shows in Montana, nighttime and daytime. Although Missoula in the summer, they both kind of feel like daytime. Yeah. I feel like you know, even at the nighttime show, you're getting like 45 minutes of darkness. Yeah, I think that the because you're up you're up north. I feel like maybe there was. Was there an earlier curfew, sem- somewhat earlier curfew there? I can't that, remember. That like we had to go on yeah. a little bit earlier too yeah. on the night one, but that that felt special. I mean, there's something also. We, this has happened a couple times in Dylan, but there's something very nice about playing a venue by a body of water. The, yeah, the Bend Oregon absolutely. show, also on that run with Mike. Um, yeah, I'm just like playing, <laughs> playing music. There's a river either behind you or a, or a reservoir or whatever it is. And I saw some. I didn't actually know this was a thing while we were playing, but I think. Maybe some other ones, but especially Bend, there was like, was that when there were shows at that amphitheater, people with stand-up paddle boards, oh, yeah. with canoes, with kayaks, with various pleasure craft. Mm. They just get out there and chill on the water, can't yep. maybe see the show, see the lights reflecting, but they hear the whole show from the, from the, the river or whatever, which I thought was very cool and a very good local vibe. Is that what was supposed to happen at Float Fest too? Float down, float down the river? I think that was how some it was. Tunes. Mm-hmm. How it was pitched, but they probably did a podcast explaining that they had to change the site or something. Yeah, I just remember something went wrong, but it was, the show was good. The show was great. As, as I recall. So yeah, the first run, resounding success, a lot of fun moments, whether it's playing Chalk Dust with Mike Gordon, and we did some other, couple other things with him. We did a Rich Man, a Cape Cod, Ska Night at the Bowl, morning version of Mary Boone, which I believe we did in... Berkeley, Berkeley, and and Missoula, uh, and Missoula. just kind of like a feel good, like like acoustic country version of Mary Boone, Peggy O, with Amber Kaufman who came up. That was a great moment. Um, should we get into some fan letters? Sure. What, 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 before before we get there, yeah. Well, actually, this is my fan letter. Yeah, yeah. Because this is real time questions, not just for the pod. How was the Olympics, man? Because you went there right after, pretty much right after the last tour ended. Um, the Olympics was great. It was uh, definitely felt a little bit last minute and, and in that sense crazy. But I, I got the call from Toma, I believe, maybe the day after we played Red Rocks or something. So already I'm like getting used to being back on the road. I'm like, whoa, that's okay. I won't be on the road. I was going to be on vacation with my family but could I do it fast and okay wow this seems like a really exciting thing it was kind of chaotic because we didn't get to do a run through so that was the first time first time through I mean I guess that's just how it is sometimes like the I mean one of the big, biggest production. events yeah. you've ever done and you don't get a run through like all right let's do this um I arrived at the Stade de France with the the whole crew you know in the afternoon and they were still building the stage and it was just like it kind of felt like a movie it was like these muscled dudes rehearsing the, this kind of like Cirque du Soleil stuff. And then like guys yelling in French, like, no, 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 you can't step there. And like holding drills and stuff. And like, you know, there was all like some central casting French characters, like, like a uh, stressed out, like kind of producer in a, uh, in like a, a power suit chain smoking. And I was, I was going like, to say, did they allow smoking in the Stade de France? People were smoke. Yeah. There were definitely people smoking nice. and there was just like a lot of yelling and like, there were chords, you know, laid here and there that I literally just watched 50 people in a row trip over. And I was just like, this is going to be crazy tonight. And then there, and then people, you know, and of course it's like people speaking different languages and stuff within the Phoenix crew there, uh, besides me, there was also, um, I mean, a lot of mostly Francophone people, the uh, air and Kavinsky and Angel, but there's also this, uh, great dude, Vonda, who's, the most famous person in Cambodia. He's a huge rapper there. Oh, cool. Enjoyed hanging out with him and his uh, managers. Shout out to them. But so, yeah, there's like a whole crew of people and like directions. And basically, we got to walk through the stage and they're kind of like, 
all right, so you'll be there and the stage is in the shape of the world. So like a dude is kind of just like, was kind of like, okay, listen, Ezra, you in the Mediterranean Sea? All you have to do, oh, you walk nice. to North Africa, you walk 10 feet and you do the show. And I'm like, okay. And he was like, don't worry, we'll get a run through. And then like 45 minutes later, sorry, we don't get a run through. But remember, Mediterranean Sea, <laughs> North Africa, you walk out there. So anyway, obviously I'm used to sound checks and yeah, things yeah, of that yeah. nature. But at the same time, this was all about Phoenix. So I was like, hey. Did you feel like you, you wanted to fly to Salt Lake City <laughs> the day before and then go back to Paris just to make sure yeah. you're on that like exactly. high, high wire, to, yeah. tired energy? The, exactly. That's what I needed. But then, then, of course, I was like, this, is, this, this thing's all about Phoenix. I'm so uh, flattered that uh, I could be part of their thing. And so, I, so again, even the fact that it seemed chaotic, I was like, whatever, I'm up there for 45 seconds, it doesn't matter. One of my favorite moments was, uh, I just saw, we were in this kind of depot waiting to go out onto the field while the, the uh, kind of performance art was happening. And I just see this like motorcycle tilted in the corner with the Olympic flag on it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I took oh, did a, you did you know that? I was Bayo's friend Tom Cruise. I didn't know. I, I knew he was. I, we saw him rehearse his jump, but I didn't know he was getting on a motorcycle. And so me and uh, Chris from Phoenix like took a picture with it, and then a couple hours later, just see him like riding it. But the one thing that stressed me out is that when I was waiting in the Mediterranean Sea with everybody before the whole thing started, and again, no run through. So there was you know some description of like when you go up, when you go up, all that stuff, but but no run through to really feel like you could visualize it. And out of nowhere, hundreds of Olympic athletes run into the Africa stage as well as the Europe stage. And nobody told us that was going to happen. And I'm looking at the Phoenix guys and I could just see they're like, what the fuck? And ultimately, and then, and then I see stressed out like uh, stage manager types sure. and people being like, and you know, the athletes, they're super young, they're pumped up. Um, they're uh, in incredible shape, and I and I just see like their energy was like crazy. People were, like <laughs> just like truly like looking up as they like, see like Brazilians, Japanese people, and Americans just all like flexing their medals and like that. And I was like, whoa, this just seems like dangerous or something. Especially because I was there when they're building the stage and there were guys yelling, "Do not step on the video screen, you'll fall through." And I was like, is this about to be a bloodbath? Anyway, it was fine, but that was maybe three minutes before showtime in a Ooh. stadium yeah. and every, I could just see people were freaked out. And then they cleared the people out. And, and then I saw pictures of the whole thing and I see like the Phoenix guys surrounded by like the it athletes. So cool. and, it, that, yeah. and I was like, well, it's good that that happened. Um, so anyway, that was a fun 32 hours in Paris. I have a question actually. Did you yeah. get to meet any Olympians and did you get to touch a medal of any kind? I didn't meet any Olympians, I'm sad to say. Um, just pull someone's gold medal like closer and say, it's a gold rush. <laughs> it's a gold rush. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, got, I got to mostly just spend time with the musicians, but I was kind of hyped to see a tall guy in the airport lounge um, on my way home. Okay, I'm thinking basketball. Could be volleyball, though. He was a, he was a tall gentleman, perceived seemingly American, and I don't want to bother him. And because people were just going up to him, and I, so, and I see he had a gold medal, and, and he was wearing it in the you know the Air France lounge or whatever. And then I see, wow, this dude's on my flight. And of course, I get curious, and I'm like, what tall dudes, what tall American dudes want, <laughs> want a gold, a gold medal? <laughs> Great search. Um, and then I started looking. I'm like, well, he was you know wasn't on the basketball team, whatever. Then I see him again um, at JFK, and then I see a little closer, and I realize, oh, it's not gold. It's bronze. So then I start rethinking my search, and I'm, but I'm still, I'm, you know, it's like it's hard. It's actually a hard thing to Google, yeah, yeah. just like American medals, and there's so many people or, organized by height. Or, yeah, of- <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I should have asked uh, some AI tool. Um, but then, luckily, there was such a buzz in customs when people see this dude, because also you had a lot of Americans coming home from the Olympics who maybe just went to watch. And luckily I, I was standing behind people where, where one guy said like, he, he and the rest of the volleyball team really made America proud. And I was like, got it. <laughs> Woo! Um, and then later I saw a, a picture of him in an article about um, extended event Pro weekend universe member Despot, who uh, has a, the bar of the summer in New York called Time Again. Okay. And there was like a GQ article. And it was like fun because they're like interview Despot and there's pictures of him and, you know, people, some people that we know. And then they're just like, 
um, and making some waves uh, on that night at time again was a member of the U.S. Uh, volleyball team who's wearing his medal. And you see the dude like party. And I'm like, oh, it's that dude. Sick. So anyway, shout out to him. I, I looked up his name, but it's shout out to the whole volleyball team. I had a cool moment where I was, uh, I'd just gotten home. My wife had, uh, as she earned, was on her own for a couple of days. So mm-hmm. I had the kids to myself. Yeah. So I was frantically so, sort of trying to get them to nap on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. And I closed the door. I was like, all right, I probably missed it. But then I like t- yeah. turned on NBC on my phone and like you started immediately. Oh, really? So it just timed out. I don't know if it was live or whatever, but the feed, I, <laughs> I closed the door yeah. on my child's nap. I was like, all right, maybe I'll catch it. And then I, I saw oh, it right away. So timing. That was cool. Oh, that's awesome. I was, it was like, cool to see you. And I mean, obviously I didn't know any of the unplanned and the athlete stuff. Right. But yeah, it just seemed like, like, a, like a really, I don't know, growing up, like you watched the ceremonies and stuff and- it was just a cool little moment, especially it that it great. wasn't like yeah. uh, it was a last minute call. You didn't have to worry about too much about it, but it was yeah, and, it was, it was awesome to see. And it there. felt it felt very cosmically right and very vampire weekendy that at the Olympics where they hand the torch from the city of Paris to the city that in, in I, confirmed vampire country. That yeah, that yeah. to the city that our clubhouse is based in, that I would have nothing to do with that part, but instead just be a little pop up for the French part. Because then, then it was like, let's get down to business. Tom Cruise, <laughs> Red Hot Chili Peppers, oh, yeah. Snoop Dogg, Billie Eilish, let's go. LA 28. And that's why we'll be doing alternative, our al- alternative Olympics programming. So we put out a call for some, some fan questions. The most common question, and this is maybe too topical mm. and too current. Too current. Yeah. Too current for this podcast. But uh, is they want to hear about Rock and Sen. 2009. Okay. Oh, right. Because Oasis, oh, Oasis just announced is, their tour. Yeah, they're, they're going to be we're, touring next year. We're doing this. We were there when Oasis broke up. Witnesses to history. Yeah. Temporarily, as it turns out. We Were we playing directly before yes, Oasis? Right before at Rock on Sun? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good billing for a, oh, yeah. a band okay. with one album. When I was doing a little research yeah. this week, I think on the poster, we were a few... We're a couple rungs smaller yeah. than Oasis. There's some people in between us. But for whatever reason, on that stage, it might have been a two-stage thing where, like, right. there was on the other side. So it was, We played, somebody else played uh, on and another then stage Oasis. than Oasis. But was, we were playing right before Oasis. And, uh, I mean, unfortunately, my main memory of that day is playing Guitar Hero with you. There was, like, a guitar... Why is that he- unfortunate of a memory? No, no, <laughs> well, no, no. I wish, well... <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Good point. Uh... I wish I was closer to a closer witness to history uh, well, of the Oasis thing. Uh, because I, I really remember playing, it was like when Guitar Hero used to have tents to like promote. And yeah. it was Guitar right, Hero. it was when Great the game. one with A-Punk. Yeah, I remember you right. and me playing came A-Punk. Out. We yeah, played A-Punk for the first time. First That's pretty sick. Um, but, well, I remember, you know, when you hear people fighting, I like, my stomach tenses up. I like, you know, you, you I, go back I, to green day. I feel as a yeah, teenager, exactly. it's, I'm it's like uncomfortable. between two people. And I just remember after we had played hearing very, very intense Mancunian accented yelling, fighting and yelling. Now I could not decipher what was being said, but our backstage was next to their yeah. headliners compound. And did you hear the guitar? Crash? And a guitar went flying did you see it? over. Well, I remember seeing the smashed one outside because mm. it kind of like popped my head out to be like, what's going on? But and somebody threw yeah, a guitar. And is, is, is that public record? Does everybody know that's what happened? I think so. I think, I think the guitar was smashed. I think that's and, like a... And that was like a $100,000 guitar, right? I would imagine possibly so. So the lads got into it. Who, Whatever they were fighting about it, we don't know who said what, but it led presumably to... Noel's beloved, extremely expensive guitar getting smashed. Yeah. And then I remember the two of you being wonderful citizens and going out into the crowd where people were like crying because the band they had been waiting all day to go see would not be playing. And you went and you comforted people in the front row. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, because it was like a funny vibe. So we went, yeah, we went out to the front row where there was a bunch of people and yeah, there were people literally in tears and stuff. And I mean, there's something about that band has a, has a very strong, strong hold. Oh my God. They're amazing. Yeah. It's, I think it's great. 
that they're getting back together. Would love to see a reunion show. Hope they make it to the States. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, I mean, yeah, I remember seeing the screen of, of, the, of the, the statement of, like, because an altercation in the band. That, Did you know, it say that? Altercation? Because wow. due to an I think, we, you know, it was probably a little bit more direct and blunt in English because I, I bet the French version of it was a little bit more nuanced or, like, unspecific. Mm-hmm. Or whatever, a different meaning, maybe. But I, the English one was, I think it said, due to an altercation within the band, yeah. the Oasis gig is canceled. And then, yeah, and then I think like Madness maybe played a little. Yes. It was too bad. I feel like we talked about, should we should we go play again? I think ultimately <laughs> Vampire Weekend LP1. We, Playing the same set roughly an hour and a half later. We we could yeah. not do no repeats there. We yeah. could, yeah. It, it, in this day and age, we could actually have some fun going back on stage. But also when, when we actually got out there and we saw the Broken Hearts, who knows, maybe those people would not be that psyched just to see this. This Insult new band kind of situation. <laughs> See this new band they barely knew, barely liked. Get back on stage and be like, you want to hear A-Punk a few more times? <laughs> but little did they know, in uh, 15 short years, Oasis would reform, and the singer of that plucky little band would be performing at the Stade de France at the closing right. ceremonies of the Paris Olympics. Summer 24. Man, what a world. Said, sorry, sorry, Oasis broke up, guys. I guess Elsa, nobody knew that they were broken no, up. No, no, definitely not. I think it was, yeah, and probably even us to some extent were like, you know, they're famously combative brothers, whatever, yeah. that like, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll play next year. But here we are 15 years later. They should in- invite us to open. They still sort of owe us would, a direct Yeah, I would slot. love that. It would be cool to have been there at the end of phase one and the beginning of phase two. That'd be a real full circle moment. It would be amazing. Yeah, come on. Come on, guys. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll have some fun. We'll put together a very unique set list. <laughs> um, Liam, you can play back. You can play Gold Rush. Oh, yeah. We bring Liam out for Gold. Oh, my God. Gold Rush. All right. So now, so for some other questions, that, would, that, that was phrased in a lot of different ways, but people are, that's very topical. Mm, people yeah. are curious about that. Uh, this is another very topical one from John O'Rourke. Uh, speaking of burning, a reference to Vampire Campfire, what is the hottest hot sauce Bayo has ever tried? You know, my mother-in-law got me the Hot Ones hot sauce pack mm. for my birthday last year. Oh, like the full 10 or whatever? Yeah. And I've tried every one short of the Bomb so far. So I think I've gotten up to number eight. Which I believe is ginger goat, which I think has like the ginger goat. The ginger okay. goat. I think that it's, there's like one like. What kind of Scoville are we talking? I got up to the one that's seven hundred sixty thousand Scoville. Oh. Um, and what does I, the scale even mean? The numbers are out of control with the Scoville. You yeah, have to ask millions. Mr. Scoville what okay. the system is. And the last one, this is kind of interesting. They haven't um, done enough Scoville research to be able to actively. <laughs> quantify what the Scoville score is. So it seems oh like the gosh. Scoville field is a developing one in terms mm. of food okay, technology. Okay, well, that's, that's cool that it's still, like, it's a new enough science that they're still, yeah. so it's I, not settled. I, I, um, I had that. I thought it was quite good. Um, there was one that I got, like... As you're getting older, do you find the hot sauce is harder or no? Well, you're not 40 yet. I mean, you're the young... I'm two months away. One, Actually, what has been slowing me down lately is I've been drinking less coffee. Now, before mm. we came to the clubhouse, CT said I can pick up some coffee for everybody, and I said, no, I'm okay. I couldn't believe it. Um, because I'm a complete Java yes. yeah. freak, mm. but I tend to get like a, sort of like discomfort in my like upper right abdomen yeah. if I drink. If I, it's like kind of like coffee. an acid reflux type mm. thing, like particularly with hot coffee, but mm. in general, if I drink too much coffee. So that I've been scaling back. With hot sauce, it's like, you know, when the time comes, I'll have it. I, I can go hard with it. You know what I mean? And, and still be fine. But that, that's kind of where I've been slowing down a little bit is the sort of coffee side of my palate. Mm. All right, so I like the idea of the doves on hot ones, but it's just you two. You're eating, but not saying not a word. Talking. And you just leisurely hang out. And you, do, you talk. Yeah, well, like why? Because no, there's no rules that everybody has to eat the hot ones. I don't know what the legal ramifications are there, yeah. but you have to talk to Sean. You have to talk to Sean. Um, here's an, here's another nice question that I found from Brissa T. How do I tell my crush I like him? 
<laughs> I thought this would get a better response. I think being direct well, just, is best. I think being direct is best. Yeah. Oh, I think it's like, personally, I'm, maybe because I'm not good at them, but uh, sort of the, the games where you're like hinting, but you're not saying because you don't want to say because it feels vulnerable. Um, that's never really worked out for me. And, you know, you, you want to do it in a classy, um, sensitive way. But I think being direct and sort of being vulnerable is, is the best way to approach mm. a potent, to potential vulnerable situation. Right. You don't have to be a rocket science to know the potential outcomes. Yeah. That's good. There's, only, there's, there's a couple. essentially two, maybe three. three. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, like with any decision-making process, visualize what, how you might feel if they say, oh, I like you too, or, or whoa, 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 we're just friends. But either way, you know, it's not hard to guess what they might be and visualize them and think about how you might feel and how you might want to act. And yeah, it's interesting too. Like the, I feel like we're, we all kind of missed the uh, app era. Oh yeah. Which is kind of crazy when you consider that that's just such a fundamental part of uh, courting in the modern right. world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I'm, we've all talked to friends who have met people that way, met, met married couples who mm -hmm. met that way. So, of course, it's extremely successful. But one thing that's interesting about it is it shows how, how many people want the straightforward thing of, I'm looking to meet somebody, you're looking to meet somebody, let's talk. That's what people want most of the time. They do like the straightforward, you know, vulnerable, get to the point kind of thing. So anyway, good luck. Good luck. Rooting for you. Uh, this one's from Kosh. How did Ezra learn the guitar? I'm an aspiring guitarist. Because one thing you don't know about yeah. Ezra, he can shred. I'm still, I'm trying. I'm still learning. I mean, the thing is, I, the, basically the way I put it, I took, a few, I took some guitar lessons, but I never studied it as rigorously as I did with the piano. So I always felt like with the piano, and the piano maybe in some ways is just an easier instrument. I don't know if that's like people get mad about me saying that, but the piano, it's like laid out in front of you. It's easier to, to learn about harmony and things like that on the piano. So with guitar, I, the truth, if I'm, you know, I took some lessons, but above all, I just tried to learn songs that I liked. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. I mean, if, uh, if you want to get into some advanced jazz stuff, I think you really should study theory and find a teacher. But if you're just kind of like seeing how you feel about the instrument, I think you got to learn Blister in the Sun by the Violent Femmes. Maybe A-Punk, that's pretty easy. Oh, yeah. Um, I was lucky that when I was learning guitar was the, uh, the peak of the uh, surf revival in America, hot off the success of the Pulp Fiction soundtrack in 1994. Um, and maybe as a reaction to kind of the grunge movement, people are getting more into uh, music of the 1960s. So there were a lot of like surf songs I wanted to learn, which were like simple melodies, you know, like Miserloo or um, Pipeline, things of that nature. I felt like learning those songs gave me some insight into just like what guitar you know that, and stuff. Was I learned like. those too the same oh, time. Really? Yeah, yeah. There the you surf go. songs. That's yeah, that the surf that's generation. That, that's that nineties. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Surf generation. Surf definitely a very important ingredient in the Vampire Weekend oh proprietary God. blend. Um, yeah, so I would just start out learning those simple things because if it maybe it is your destiny to become a, a kind of music theory type person and the guitar will open up to you as this like incredible instrument. But if it is maybe just something that you're gonna like mess around on, I think start out learning some simple riffs that it'll just like teach you a little bit about how you can approach guitar. Uh, this one is from Craig Brian. The last name's cut off here. Craig Bryan, SC. When will Ezra realize the truth and convert to being a Mets fan? Oh. Well, what, what is the official Vampire Weekend baseball affiliation? You did say go Mets at the end of a Vampire Campfire yeah, I episode mean, while Cousin Harrison is playing well, over actually, there. The more interesting question, actually, is how do you feel? Because you're a lifelong Yankees fan, right? Very, very casually oh, growing really? up. Oh, yeah, casually? so I... I I, at my core, I'm a hockey fan. I'm, right. a, I'm a fan of the New York Rangers and Harrison yeah. Bader. So wherever Harrison is playing, that is the team that I support. I was a Cardinals fan for half a decade. Right. What if you? What if you? What if Harrison pulled a Michael Jordan switch sports and got traded to the Islanders? 
That I don't. I couldn't do that. Oh, really? You'd still be like, I love I would, you, bro. I love, but, I love you, bro. I'll, I'll but, come to your Islanders games. Bro. Rangers uh, all day. Yeah, Rangers all day. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't. I look. I'm. I'm a very casual, extremely casual sports fan to begin with. So I got nothing against the Mets, but um, I just think sometimes that you got to play the hand you're dealt. And also, I got. I also got to say, I'm just not from a big sports family. The famous story in my family is that um, my uncle took my dad and his nephews to uh, like a Yankees game, probably in like 1969, and my dad brought a book. But also, just because my family's from the Bronx, if there's any team right. I ever heard, like even my grandmother used to say, oh, I always used to listen to the Yankees games while I was ironing. And so, like, again, they never talked about any kind of sport. So I have to keep that tiny little flame alive that this is the only... And honestly, I bet if, <laughs> I, bet if I went to my dad and I was kind of like, Dad, you know, you're born and raised in the Bronx. You know, I remember those memories of going to Grandma and Grandpa's apartment. Could you ever forgive me if I rooted for the Mets? He would just be like, what are you talking about? I don't care. <laughs> but I still like that small, small regional uh, connection. But at the end of the day, one thing that I do... You're just a fan of New York sports culture. I like, and I like yeah. New York sports culture mm-hmm. just because I like, I like tri-state area culture. That's what I like. I like Long Island, Westchester, Connecticut, New Jersey, subs, path train. I like all this stuff, you know? Yeah. I thought you were going to keep going like the first episode of like the tone poem thing. Oh, yeah. Just You're going to keep going a, tri-state. Uh, Top the of the st- dome. Staten Island Ferry. Um, Cos Cobb. I think I did put Cos Cobb. Yeah, I think it in that. Yeah, now I'm back to that. <laughs> uh, all right. Two more quick ones. This one's actually a little bit difficult, but I like the framing. It's very unexpected. This is from Josh Pagioli. Forgive, forgive me if I didn't pronounce that correctly. What song reminds you the most of having breakfast? can be one of your guys' songs or any song. Having breakfast. I'll, I'll go first. This is, this is a very specific time in my life, but uh, I studied abroad in Ireland, and this was the days of, like, f- fettel iPods, and that was my, like, alarm clock. I didn't have, like, I didn't have a smartphone, so that was, mm-hmm. like, what I woke up to. And I'm not sure why, but I had my wake-up song as Stage Fright by, okay. the band, by the band. <laughs> yes. Interesting. So I feel like there was that's the only time I've had a regular alarm, music-based alarm. Now it's iPhone, you know, it's like noises, whatever, uh, or radio where it's random. So this is for six months, I would wake up every day to Stage Fright. So I feel like that's my answer. Damn, dude. Uh, but it's also funny, I got to say, I can't remember how this joke started Be. I like the band, but I, I don't really know the song Stage Fright that well. But for some reason, jo- this yeah. joke started where maybe because I knew you liked that song that I would make up my own version of Stage Fright. In the style of Led <laughs> in Zeppelin. In the style of Led Zeppelin. So I always pretend that the song Stage Fright by the band went like this. Stage Fright, frightened all night. Get me away from the stage. All right. Um, <laughs> which is le- which is way less breakfasty. What, what, wait, what are the actual lyrics? Does he say, "Get me away from the stage"? All right. Stage. No, he does not. He does not. <laughs> stage fright, frightened all night. It, I mean, it's, it's literally about stage fright, but right. I don't. I don't think it. I don't think that's is it. There. Is it kind of like a similar vibe to like uh, deep in the heart of a lonely Ophelia, kid, or is it like funky? It's a little funk. It's kind of funky. Yeah, it's a Danko led mm. uh, Danko song tune. Stage fright. Yeah, that's interesting because you'd assume stage fright is mo- most shows the, take place at night. Right. Yeah. The the lyric that the song it's it's more of a contextual for me yeah. than the song itself. Do you think maybe for they're the, doing a daytime show at yeah, the garden? That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whenever we do a matinee, you set your alarm. To the stage, stage fright. fright. You know what? <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. Waking up Sunday, October sixth. Um. I, yeah. I mean, when I when I sometimes put on morning music or something, I mean, maybe this comes from just like growing up and. My mom would be listening to whatever the classical radio station was in uh, New Jersey or New York. I want to say 96.3. And, and so I picture in the morning, on like a Sunday morning or something, when you might be having breakfast, they'd be tending to play Baroque music. So I could mm. really hear like a harpsichord. Mm. They get into like the harsher stuff, you know, 12, t- 12 tone in the afternoon. But I always associate that with breakfast. And then I've... This has maybe just become my go-to thing whenever... I always feel like I'm not 
maybe because I'm a musician, and I'm sure you guys have this too, and people are like, oh, put on a put on a playlist or something. I'm like, uh, what? Whereas other people are just really good. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, got a, I got the perfect playlist. Or, oh, have you heard this radio or something? And I never totally know which, uh, what to play, but I, this is the last music I played at breakfast because I realized, you know what? To me, this music just always has a good vibe, always makes me happy and makes and sets an atmosphere. Is I just put on some uh, some Django, you know what I mean? Like you come, you come down in the kitchen in the morning, heating up some waffles, some Django's playing, uh, Django Reinhardt, of course. You know, it's just it's like a good vibe. Maybe some people would find it like kind of corny, but I I don't know. To me, that music is kind of eternally cool, and and has like a sweet, pleasant atmosphere. You know, you're a little rushed in the morning, but that kind of adds a nice little tang to it. What's up tempo kind of gets you up, but it's not aggressively so. Yeah, I, I love that vibe. Works at night too. Well, I would say where my mind goes is my wife is not the biggest music person. She is hard of hearing, never, you know. I was always kind of a music obsessive and dragging her to concerts, but there was a period of time in college and she grew up loving Cat Stevens mm. where she would kind of get up in the morning and blast morning is broken in a mm. semi-ironic way I would say it but was always a very funny great beautiful song so that'll be, that'll be my choice for breakfast song morning I really like the framing of that question did not expect it didn't expect it what was the best rook book you've read in the last year for this man John Pritchett it was Infinite Jest or Lonesome Dove so he was he was Big getting oh, a start he was busy he was busy Hey. Getting a lot of words. Oh in. boy! Um, and because I, I read this, I can go first. Give you guys a little time to think. Uh, I think my favorite book I've read in the last year or so is called *The Dreamt Land*, which is a n- nonfiction book about the Central Valley of California. Uh, it's by this guy. I believe his name is Mark Arax, who grew up in grew up there. And it's kind of about you know water resources dwindling. It's about mm. the big farms. It's about the communities. It was just it was a really thick dense book but it didn't feel that way it felt very like his vision of it was romantic but still still kind of realistic and i don't live there obviously but i've driven through and i was very curious about it so there's something really played a vampire weekend show in the central valley that's true i've been there a couple times if i sell you uh when bakersfield i think would be does that count central valley yeah um anyways but it was it was just kind of felt like a really like a window into this slice of the world that maybe i wouldn't have gotten otherwise within this book Mm. So uh, you, you, I read that book that I gave you a copy of, The Sun, S-O-N. The name of the writer is escaping me, but read it in my book club. It's just some Texas cowboy shit, and usually you're my Western guy, but it's sort of two families over generations and uh, dealing with stolen land and resources and all that good stuff, and uh, I thought that book was incredible. So that's been my favorite thing I've read this year. Philip Meyer. And he has a new book Bill coming Meyer. out, I believe, next year is first in like 11 years. So I'm excited Can't for that. Can't wait to pick that up. Yeah. Lately, I've been in one of those kind of funny zones. You're just reading a little bit of this, a little bit of that. One thing that I read a few years ago, and I kind of came back to it, it's because it's a very thin pamphlet, but I do find him to be a very interesting guy. Is uh, Byung Chul Han. You guys familiar with him? He's a, a South Korean born but longtime resident of Germany, uh, philosopher, and he writes in German, so I think he really identifies as culturally German. Apparently, outside of the English-speaking world, he's like one of, maybe one of, if not the most famous, like contemporary philosopher. And the good thing about his books, they're real thin. There can sometimes be that philosophical stuff where you're like, whoa, hold on, what do you mean? But they're thin, and he gets through them quickly. And the, and the one that I found the most interesting... And I've returned to, it's called The Disappearance of uh, Ritual. And uh, it's an interesting analysis of kind of the, uh, the feeling of uh, modern life. And there's a quote that really stayed with me. He, he might have been quoting another philosopher. I don't know if this is his original idea, but it's that uh, ritual is to time as a room is to space. You know, like rooms make you feel at home in the vast expanse of space. And ritual makes you feel at home in the vast expanse of time. So, Love chew, that. so chew on that. Uh, and speaking of ritual, we'll see you on tour. Should I get the fire? Yeah, babe, you mind putting this out? I'll put it out. 